Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Practical Proficiency Podcast. This is a really special episode because we have a guest, as you can see, or you'll be able to hear in a minute for our audio friends. Timothy is here to talk to us about his presentation because he is a presenter this year at Practical and Comprehensible Celebrate. This is part of our special, really fun Get to Know the Speaker series. So after you check out the presentations, or even before, if you're sly, you can get to know the presenters a little bit better right here. Timothy, I'm so excited to hear more about your presentation. And so the viewers and the listeners have a little more context. Timothy is in his 10th year of teaching Spanish, is a researcher by nature, love that, who adores reading about language acquisition and then putting that research into practice by developing his own unique tasks for students. He's also a queer educator whose goal is to always find ways to incorporate the identities of marginalized groups into his curricula and lessons. And your presentation is dialed in to this for what we're for what you're going to be talking about at PNC. Language as lenses, designing thematic units for cultural insights and social justice. I'm so here for this. Timothy, take it away. Tell us a little bit more about your presentation that's going to be live and free on your day three. So I think it's July 31st, right? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, for letting me present, and then having me here on the podcast. I I, I chose actually the, the topic of the presentation specifically with my bio in mind, you know, it's like these these are the the things that are so important to me. Is I really love content based language teaching, and so using thematic units goes really well with that. Um, but then I also like as a queer educator, I believe that when we develop units, we have to specifically cite the elements of social justice that we plan to cover in our units. And that doesn't mean that those are the only ones that we cover. It just means we need to make sure that we actually explicitly plan for it. And the same goes for, for the cultural products, practices, and perspectives. I think sometimes we assume that, oh, if we're going to bring in other voices, that those things are going to be innate. Um, but when we when we do that, I find that oftentimes the products and the practices are, are present in our units, but the perspectives are not always there. And so I think having an outline, a, 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 an outline that forces you to specifically say, these are the ways that I'm going to include products, practices, perspectives, social justice, um, themes versus topics, um, and it is really important because then the units will let out what we are hoping to accomplish. Um, and so that's another thing that you'll, I start my presentation with topic versus theme, because I think that, that those words oftentimes get confused. Um, and so people will be like, oh, I do a thematic unit and it's all about food. And like that, but food is a topic and not a theme. And so I think sometimes, especially in the CI world, thematic units sometimes get a bad reputation because they're misunderstood as being like the traditional textbook topics. And it's really not. It's taking that topic and applying a theme to go deeper into, into the language and the culture and the social justice and everything that I am hoping to include in my, in my curricula. Uh, this is gorgeous. I resonate with so much of this because as a as a content creator who's focused on social justice as well, like this speaks to me so much. I love too how you're nailing very much so the fact that intentions are one thing, but putting structure into your curriculum is how you're actually going to achieve those goals. Like when you when you're intentionally planning for it, and when you have objective measures of these are the things we want students to get out or to grow from or how they're going to expand culturally their their point of view how they're going to be more open or more aware of these topics that's the way that you're really going to get there instead of having to feel like you know all, all of this content is your burden to bear of showing students like the entire world when you instead are focused in on like i have structure that i can follow that is going to lead people to like practically, very practically, like the outcomes that they're looking for and that they want from classes. Like I want my students to be 
more aware of things going on in the world and to connect deeply to social issues. But you honestly can't just do that by like, I'm going to talk about culture themes. Like it has to be very intentional, but this is an easier way to do it is when you're thinking more about the, the deeper structure of the way that you build units. So can you tell us more about that too? Because your, your approach to this, like with making it very clear, the difference between themes and topics is so unique and needed in what we're trying to do here. And especially like what you're focusing on with your presentation. So uh, first and foremost, I will say that that distinction is definitely not mine, um, but it is something that I have made a goal of mine because I do think it's something that's not talked about enough. Um, and like and like you were saying, the intentionality is, is important for ourselves, but it's also important for our co-teachers, you know, those of us who are teaching the same course, like we deserve to have the same unit plan. Um, and the students, that's another social justice aspect is the students deserve to have the same experience when they're taking the same course, even if the teacher might be different. And so I think that's another piece of like having it written down. And so, yeah, my, my presentation specifically goes through each section of of the unit template that I designed. It's it's largely based on the one that comes from the Department of Ed from Massachusetts, mm -hmm. but I added certain pieces that I thought were important, you know, the, the cultural products, practices, and perspectives, and, and the social justice piece, because if those things, yeah, like I was saying, if they're not explicitly written on the unit plan, then it's, and it also makes it really difficult to to develop your your daily lesson plans, right? Because if you if you know what social justice topic you really want to be looking at, then it makes it easier for you to search YouTube or find authentic resources or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, this distinction for me has become very important because I I. I think incorporating social justice is, is a lot easier when you have a theme. And so if we are just doing a unit on food, that's great for language acquisition. Um, it's a little bit harder for the, for the cultural perspectives and the social justice. And so I would say then take your theme, the lens, I like the, the way I like to think of a, a theme is really just the lens through which you're going to look at the topic. So if, if we take food, for example, it could be hunger, right? Or it could be access to food. Um, it could be clean water, you know, things like that. I also like to look at the, the UN global goals. They have their, I think, 17 global goals that are really related to social justice topics. And so if I'm like, okay, I want to do a unit on food, how can I make a theme out of this? Sometimes I can go there and find a, a theme from there. Um, so it's really just, it, it, it centers the, the unit so that you are not only just going about like, oh, these are different foods in this other country, right? That's just that's products. That's the very basic of culture or, or we eat at this time, right? That's, that's, practices, right? But if you have a theme, it makes it easier to be like, okay, but the perspective through which I want to look at this social justice lens, usually they go hand in hand, the social justice and the cultural perspectives. It's like, if you have both of those on the unit plan, you're golden. Golden. And that's <laughs> the hardest part for us to add and to put a lot of time and effort into, Which, but it's the most important part. Like it's the part mm -hmm. that deserves to be shown to our students the most is the perspectives. But you're right, it's it's hard to do that. And perhaps we as teachers can uh, give ourselves some grace and realize that like, if we have a better system to do this, like it's not all on us. Like if you have a better system to look through this, like you're giving us, then perspectives can be a more natural facet of your lesson plan. Instead of having to, you know, like pull it out of things or really go deep down the rabbit hole to find appropriate things. Like that's such a simple solution to go to the, the UN global goals because they, they are, they're, they're right there. They're easy to find. That's such a good idea. And they have resources in, at least in Spanish. I'm not sure about other, other languages, but mm -hmm. so sometimes I can really just go right to their website and then find the, the interpretive reading that I want to use. And then it's like, Ooh. Um, so yeah, it gives it gives us that lens, and it's it's important too because I think also 
specifically in my presentation, the example unit and part of my launch pad is a novice unit because I think oftentimes we think that novices can't do the cultural perspectives or can't do the social justice piece. And it's not that they can't, and it's not that they shouldn't be exposed to it. Perhaps when it comes to a performance assessment where they're speaking, maybe that doesn't come out in the performance assessment, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be in the unit, right? Um, so, and, and they will surprise you. Oftentimes those things do still show up. Um, but I think if we look at like, the cultural standards, sometimes it's like, oh, novice is really focusing on products and practices. But I think of that as products and practices in terms of what they might produce, but not in terms of what I should, as their teacher, expose them to. That is such a beautiful distinction in that. In Because this is so important too, and like why I'm obsessed with novices is because that's who we work with the most. Like we can't mm -hmm. just say like, well, you know, like what about my novices? Novices are most of the people that you work with for your entire career. So it's especially important to not count them out for a lot of that. And that's a nice, really clear distinction of maybe not on the production side, but the stuff that they're exposed to, they're absolutely ready to internalize. For sure. And That's we want to reach them at their cognitive level as well, right? Yeah. Maybe their linguistic level might be lower, but their cognitive level isn't. So, mm -hmm. Oh, that's good too. I love that. So tell me more too about, we talked a lot about how you incorporate this into the structure of your unit plan. And I know people are just going to be so excited to see you break it down for them in your, in your presentation for Practical and Comprehensible. I would love to know more about how you incorporate this since you're a research junkie. Like <laughs> I'm so excited to hear about like, how do you incorporate this into your lessons? Cause you know, the jump from research to practice can be hard a lot of the times in the classroom. For sure. Um, so in terms of the, the social justice piece, um, when I'm searching for my resources, if it is a social justice piece, like if I'm talking about queer identities, I have no problem talking about myself. Um, but if I'm talking about an identity that I don't have, I always want to bring in somebody else's voice, somebody who actually experiences that. And so when I'm searching for my my resources, that's, that's my first thing is like, is this, if I'm talking about an Afro-Indigenous group or if I'm talking about a person with dyslexia and their experiences as a child, it needs to be somebody who's who experiences that, right? The voice that comes out needs to be from them. Um, and so that's usually where I will start is I will look for interpretive assignments um, because I do believe that interpretive is really the most important mode for acquisition. Um, and so I will pull those. And then what I like to do is, is base my lesson plans off of those resources. So when it comes down, once I have my unit design, when it comes to developing the lesson plans, I start automatically with interpretive. And then I try to make it so that I can do multiple things with that single interpretive so that I don't spend all my time planning and just looking for resource after resource after resource, right? Like, so I want, I want to really take not only the language, but the content of that resource and use it multiple times. Because the benefit of like what we were talking about is how maybe it won't show up in their performance assessments or in their production. If we give them enough scaffolded input, it might, right? And that, and so it's not that they can't, it's just that they need so much scaffolding. Um, and so I will take that resource and, and just let it guide the rest of the curriculum. Um, and so I make sure that whatever's in that interpretive is also on an interpersonal assessment or activity. It doesn't have to just be an assessment. And then whatever is on that interpretive is also on the presentational, right? So it's just that the, our interpretive got resources can guide our lesson plans um, to make it make sure that we're meeting the needs of of the the unit design. And that's why I think it's so important to have a really structured unit design because then you can, find the right interpretive resources that fit that the needs of the unit. In a way for some people, and I know I used to do it this way, that can feel backwards. Like where usually you start with a, like with a goal in mind and then you create activities and you're like, I'm going to find an interpretive to match this. But this sounds like it would work so much better where you're finding the, 
the the glorious interpretive, the one that's really, really good that you can even probably use for years to come and base a lot of your activities on it. Do your students feel a lot more comfortable too when they see like, oh, I remember that. I remember reading that. This is the same structure, same sentence, everything like that. I bet you that repetition makes them feel really comfortable. Absolutely, because you can take it and and I and I do still view this as backwards design, right? Because it is still mm -hmm. starting with the assessment. It's just the assessment for me is usually at the beginning when it comes to interpretive, um, and then the performance is at the end. Um, yeah, but students, because I will take pieces from it, like the interpretive guides them. Um, I like to use my own version of Actful's Appendix D, um, where it's like main idea detection, supporting details, and inferencing, which is another thing that people often think novices cannot do, which they absolutely can, um, right? So then I just take those pieces from the supporting details and then I'll, I'll adjust it in my own way. Was this mentioned in the text? And they, they'll reread a lot of things from the text and um, true or false, right? Then drawing certain aspects of a sentence, um, making connections to it, right? It's like you can just really just constantly be pulling, 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 and and then it's not, because what I've found is I've, I've had those times when I've used like resource overload and I just had so many resources, so many infographics. Mm -hmm. And I find that then I'm kind of disappointed at what happens at the end. And I think it's just because linguistically the the resources are so different. Even if the content is the same, sometimes the, the, the linguistic ability is just really, really difficult. And we also have to remember that we are language teachers as well. And so it's it's not only about the content, we have to be thinking about the content and acquisition at the same time. And I think that that's why the research for me has been so pivotal in, in especially learning about the role of input, um, because that is when I realized like, my passion needs to be on interpretive assessments. <laughs> yeah, that's powerful. I love the way that you that you're structuring this. This is dynamite. Cause well, because you're right. Like it's still, of course, it's still backward design. It's just that you're focusing on the right things, like the things that are going to get you to your outcome in a way where your students know exactly what they should be focusing on too and what's going to reap the most reward for them linguistically. If you're working with a few really high quality documents rather than the, I've never thought about that before, but that's a great perspective because that's really true is the resource overload is when you're giving students something new to look at, maybe some, like twice or three times a day, like infographic here, blast, 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 blast. Like I wonder how much that contributes to a lot of the like, like brain fizzle that happens. Yeah, inside. and in terms of like con connections to other um, other content areas, like sometimes right before the performance assessment, I'll tell my students like, on this performance assessment, I am expecting quote integration, but I don't want to give them the entire text because then they really could just copy blah blah. Yeah. blah. And so, their homework assignment might be you need to go home and you need to pull out three important quotes from this text that you're going to be able to explain on your writing assignment stuff. And that's, again, another way for me to bring them back to the text right before their performance assessment, right? So it's like, and and then I can give them feedback the same way that their English teacher would, you know, is like, okay, here's, you can introduce your quote a little bit better here. Or make sure you explain your quote and don't just, I find sometimes kids will, will throw quotes in like sprinkles on top of a donut. They're just throw it in here and start a sentence with a quote, right? And so then I'm not only teaching them the content and, and the Spanish language, but also I'm, I'm making connections to other content areas and how I can help them be better writers, better speakers. And it's, yeah, I think it really is important to, to limit our sources or our resources. And it doesn't mean that you can't use multiple and stuff. It's just be cautious. Mm -hmm. Such words of wisdom. I, I've, I've learned a lot from this. This is great. All right, I have another question for you then. Is that when you're talking about your, when you're making like your actual lessons, we talked a lot about incorporating them with your, with your social justice structure that you have in place. And as well as the, the research, acquisition driven research, as well as, you know, how, how we're, if we're borrowing a term from our own field, like acquiring like social justice awareness and themes that they go through the years. I have a question for you, which is how do your students react to having like 
socioculturally rich lessons, like stuff that, uh, and like, especially through a social justice lens, how do they usually react to that? This is something that I find students are actually getting used to it. I mean, I, I teach in public school and I teach in Massachusetts, right? So this is actually in our Massachusetts world language standards, social justice is a part of our standards. So it's required for us here. So I think by the time they get to me in high school, they're kind of already used to it. Um, and they also do a lot of this in their other courses as well, not just in world language. Um, but, or I should say, and I do worry about that sometimes as well. You know, it's like, I don't want them to feel like they have to have the same opinion that I have, mm -hmm. right? I can expose them to what I believe is a social justice issue, but it's up to them to have their own opinions on that. And they, I make it very clear to them, like, you are always allowed to disagree with me. Just make sure you disagree with me in Spanish, please. Um, and so the other thing that I've been implementing recently, because I, I do want to consider students' comfortability with certain topics as well. Um, and so I've, I've recently dipped my toes into storytelling, because like I said at the beginning, I'm very into content-based language teaching, but I think we need to pull a little bit of of strategies from other areas as well. And so I started using very, very short stories. And instead of just doing the literal comprehension activities, I started then also analyzing the text from various social justice perspectives. And I'll, I'll develop questions from like, let's say I give them a, a short story and, a, and there will be questions on queer theory. There will be questions on socioeconomic status. Like you can analyze a text from any lens if you really, really think deeply enough. And so I'll give them the choice. I'll say there are five different papers with all different um, social justice lenses. You get to choose the one through which you want to analyze the text. Mm. Um, and that way then if there are concerns or parental concerns, I can say that, well, this was their choice, right? I didn't, I didn't force them to talk about queer theory or I didn't force them to talk about socioeconomic status, right? I gave them the options through which they wanted to analyze the text. And I've been, I've found that that has been really, really well received from students. And then the, the great thing about that is when we do dialogic instruction or we really talk about the text from a deeper perspective, um, students are learning from each other because they, many of them looked at the, the text from a different lens. And so they did, for example. Um, but I think oftentimes students bring perspectives that I wasn't expecting them to bring. And that's why I really, really love open-ended authentic questioning techniques because students are also thinkers. And so if we give them the option to show that they are thinkers and that they can provide content to the course as well, it's important. What a way to bring them into the conversation too and show them that like you're just as much a part of the classroom and as much as this thought process as I am. Like I'm sure that they feel really like into the fold with this rather than the whole, you know, the gatekeeper thing that we're trying to get away from. Like that just, like it's a natural structure of back and forth conversation where like the student has just as much to add as you do. Yes. That's exciting. It's an exciting way to teach. Yeah. And, and you asked me about like research integration and this is where I've brought in the research on interlanguaging, which I know is, I mean, translanguaging, excuse me, yeah. um, which I know is a whole different conversation, but that's a, another way to be a culturally responsive teacher and have these conversations while allowing both target language use and L1 as well. Oh, absolutely. I'm excited to start looking that up. I'm getting so cool right now. This is great. So I'm not, when did you start teaching? Because when I, when I started teaching, like doing social justice in the classroom was something that uh, you'd get varying reactions to from students. So this is, it's really exciting to hear from you that in like in the area that you're at in Massachusetts, it could also be a South Carolina thing. That's definitely a reality that students are like, they're accustomed to it. And they now are at the point where like they have choices to go with it. That's really cool. Yeah, and I, th I think that's my recommendation for, for areas that might be a little bit more conservative mm -hmm. is you give them the choice, give them the choice. Um, but yeah, I started 10 years ago and 10 years ago, I would say a lot of the stuff I do now, I, I would have been very concerned about doing. Um, and so it's been nice to see like, 
even my comfortability in terms of talking about my own family, right? Like when I do, when we do the family unit, like I, there was a point in my life where I was like, should I talk about my, my fiance or, and then once I got past that bump and I was like, nope, he's a part of my family and he belongs there. Mm -hmm. um, that was almost like my, my step really into it. And it was like, once I saw the student reaction was so normal and nobody even like batted an eye, then I was like, okay, actually, I, I think that this is really important. And then in 2021 is when we came out with our new Massachusetts standards and seeing social justice on there was like such a, a relief for me because it was stuff that I had been doing for so long. And now that is my, that's my protection, you know, is to say, well, I'm meeting my standards by doing this. <sighs> That's amazing. And like yeah. too, for like for other teachers who like taught in the in similar areas as me um, and South Carolina is very, you know, it's regional based. But if you're in a more conservative area, like there's social justice standards that are nationalized, like the like the SPLC has them out there. They're mm -hmm. for everyone. So you can cite those, too. Um, that's really that's a very affirming message to hear, too, is how you, like your journey as an educator, too. That's really, really cool. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing that with us. Of Timothy, course. oh my gosh. So I want to hear some more about you've been um so you teach in Massachusetts and you started teaching around the same time as me then. And what do you do high school or middle school? What do your classrooms usually look like? So I started in high school and then I went to middle school and I'm back at high school. Uh I would say I really miss. Um, I really miss middle school. I think yeah. that that was, that was for me, for sure. Um, however, my department right now where I am in Massachusetts is, is more important to me that, than the age of my students. And so like being able to do this thematic unit, like I feel like where I am now, I, I can really grow professionally and teach the way that I want to teach. And so that was, yeah, that that's was incredible. Important. Yeah, that's what was important to me. So I was like, you know what, I, I, I can, I can move to high school for all of the benefits that come with that, you know. But I, I do miss, I do miss the middle schoolers. Yeah, oh, man. <laughs> the middle, oh, the middle. I started in the middle for like a little bit, but high school is definitely in my area. So it's all, it's always funny to hear what the differences are. I know it's so interesting. That's awesome. Timothy, thanks so much for sharing all this with us. We we got into a lot of good stuff, and I already have like a list of things that I'm about to go look up and and learn learn. I learned a lot from you here, so I know that uh, those of you who are listening and watching all that good stuff, I'm sure that you got a lot out of this too. And I'm so excited for you to share everything that you have to share in the conference coming up, and uh, y'all can register for that with. Timothy's special link that will support him and all of his magical education endeavors. So yes to that for the affiliate stuff, but it's a free conference that will only benefit you. So you can sign up below in the show notes in podcast form, or if you're on YouTube, it will be in, in all the, that, whatever that little box is underneath YouTube <laughs> will be there. All the things Timothy close us out with, what do you think? What do you hope people how do you hope people start their year this year? Because we're like recording this in the summertime. What do you hope for yourself with your new school year? And what do you hope for other teachers as they're starting their next school year? For other teachers, I hope that they start with one goal. Um, because I've been that teacher who is like, I need to redo everything. And, and that is just not sustainable. And I'm a big proponent for a 40-hour teacher work week, right? Trying not to take work home and stuff. So so focus on one thing and let that be your thing. And the rest of it can be for future years. For myself, um, I am I am finally going to have my own classroom. And so I am hoping to be able to make it so that it is a, a space that is usable as opposed to like just decorative. You know, I want to have word walls and anchor charts and, and transition words and stuff so that my students can actually use what's around them and not just look at all these pretty things. So the works. <laughs> oh my God, you're getting your own classroom. This is like an inaugural year. Yeah, it's it's pretty big, especially having gone from having my own classroom to not having my own classroom. It's been a, a big shift. So I'm like, Tragic. all the things that like, 
I used to do and would like to then now improve, I finally can do it. Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for everything you share for our field and all the, all the great ways that you are, that you're pushing us. We appreciate you for that. And thanks for being here. And thanks to you. Share all your work with you're doing the exact same thing and we love you. <laughs> oh my God. Thank <laughs> you. That's so awesome. All right. We have to close it out for now. You know, we could talk forever, but come to the conference so you can hear all about everything that Timothy's doing. We'll see yes, you. Bye. Bye.